starting soon. Better put. Okay, it's 14.05. Where's the red sign? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to First Baptist Church Community Connection. This is a COVID-19 update called Weathering the Omicron Storm. So we welcome everybody on Facebook, and YouTube, uh, please get ready. Now, uh, the session today is intended for educational purposes only, and the opinions expressed are those of the professionals who have been invited on this platform to speak, and theirs and theirs alone. So uh, this is the disclaimer. By reading this, you hereby agree to this particular disclaimer. You may contact our church for further questions relating to this session, if we wish to find out more about our Alpha program. And also at the end of this, uh, the video of this presentation will be left on the YouTube. So today we're gonna look at the Omicron storm. We're right in the middle of it. We've got almost 30,000 every single day. How bad is Omicron? Is it really less severe than Delta? Are there medications for this COVID-19? Any updates? A lot of confusion lot of uh, excitement because of the numbers and yet we're not really uh, loose uh, uh, tightening up we're actually doing the opposite or we're doing what we opposite for what we've been doing the last one year in fact we're loosening up so what's the deal all right so we've got two speakers with us today uh, infectious disease specialist dr timothy williams will go through the nuts and bolts of uh, the disease and what do we do about it to protect ourselves and Dr. Uh, Ms. Christine Mariana Gabriel, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist to address some of the psychological and social problems that are associated with this terrible pandemic that's been raging on for the last two years. Okay, so with us today, I'm very thankful that we actually have had a real expert to speak on this. We've had ICU specialists, pediatricians, but we've never had an infectious disease specialist. They're so hard to find. And not only that, hard to find, it's hard for them to find the time to, to give us to be able to come and share. They are the actual authorities on what COVID-19 virus, they know how the virus comes about, they know what it causes. So uh, it's a real privilege to have Dr. Timothy Williams, who works at the uh, Subang Jaya Medical Center, to be able to give us his wisdom on this particular topic and helping us weather the Omicron storm. So without further ado, it's a great a pleasure for me this afternoon to welcome my colleague, Dr. Timothy Williams. Over to you, Tim. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peter. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to share about uh, COVID-19. Now, let me just go to the slides. Um, can, I, can the host allow me to share my slides? Okay, the COVID-19 started in 2019, it's 2022 now. And as you can see, we thought it initially thought that it's going to be a short battle, but it looks like it's turning out to be a long, drawn out war. That's why the title of the topic is the war against COVID-19. Now, uh, we have the variants that are coming out, and I want to discuss with you all the implications of the Omicron variant on COVID-19 on our health and also the vaccinations. So the objectives I hope at the end of this, I'll be able to convince you that despite all the that's been said about COVID, the breakthrough infections, Omicron, I hope that 
uh, I'll be able to convince you, number one, that uh, vaccination will reduce the risk of being infected with COVID-19. It will reduce the risk of severe COVID-19, including deaths, and to a certain extent, reduce the risk of spread of COVID-19. So who are the people who get uh, COVID-19? And why do some people get very severe disease? These are the risk factors for the severity of the disease and fatal um, and, and fatality. The age, uh, the older a person is, the higher the risk of them getting severe disease. So someone who's 70 or 80 getting COVID-19 can be potentially life-threatening as compared to someone who's much younger. Also comorbidities. Now, everyone doesn't, uh, it, there's a big difference between a healthy uh, young adult without any diseases as compared to someone who's older or someone's even younger, the same age, but with comorbidities such as cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, respiratory diseases, hypertension, and cancer. I just want to give you uh, what doctors see uh, when the patient has COVID. One is dust to the lungs. Now you can see this is the CT scan on the lung. The black area is the normal lung. The white lung, the white areas are the areas that are affected by COVID. As you can see, all the airways are consolidated and filled with fluid. So because of this, there's very little, uh, it's very difficult for gas exchange to occur. So we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide. The oxygen has to go from the airways to the alveoli and then from the alveoli it has to cross the, the, the barrier between the alveoli and the capillaries and then the oxygen needs to go into the uh, blood, blood supply. But what COVID-19 does is fills, fills its airways with, uh, with uh, infectious fluid, like, you know, to put it simply, and also blocks the gas exchange between uh, the lungs and the capillaries. So this is a CT scan of, on treatment on day 19 after symptom onset. So the progression of disease, now this keeps changing. Now most people will have mild to moderate uh, infection. Uh, I'll give you an example. So they may have a, a sore throat, a cough, a rhinorrhea, especially in the Omicron variant. But then, and, and many of them actually recover without any complications. They do not get more sick. They are sick only unwell. They feel unwell for two, three days and then they get better. In fact, there are also many who don't even know they have COVID and get better without even realizing that they have COVID. However, there's a small percentage of significant percentage of people who go on to get severe disease. And for that, these people on day six to day eight, and it varies depending on whether they're vaccinated or not, or whether they have comorbidities now, but roughly around day six, day eight, they can become short of breath and become more severe. And there's also a phenomenon where a person doesn't become short of breath, but the oxygen level comes uh, very, very low or uh, something. Uh, that's why COVID has been known as the silent uh, killer, where they, uh, they become hypoxic, but they're silent, comfortable, happy, hypoxic. That's a term that... Uh, Use. They're not happy, but it's, it's a term that's given because people think they're okay, but their oxygen levels are very low. And you know, when you see the cases are brought in dead, uh, yesterday we saw the news that 90% of the people who are brought in dead didn't even know they had COVID. So they may have felt tired, uh, they may not have had any symptoms, but their oxygen levels are very low. So the transmission of COVID. It's transmitted by a droplet aerosol, but now actually it's been shown that it can, can be considered airborne, especially indoors. When COVID first started uh, in 2019, 2020, I actually gave talks, and many people gave talks that it is droplet spread. What does droplet spread mean? Droplet spread mean, means that if you are standing further away from a person, two meters away, uh, further away, two meters, it's very unlikely for you to get COVID-19. That's what we we, we were taught that's what we were told. However, uh, very soon after they discovered that actually it's not droplet load, it can be considered airborne, uh, indoors especially. So, can airborne transmission occur? Air, transmission of SARS CoV 2 from inhalation of virus in the air farther than six feet from an infectious source can occur. So, uh, bottom line is, when they, they, when, they, when they mention social distancing, 
they mentioned don't go closer to a person closer than six feet. That's what social distancing means. Huh? But airborne transmission means that even though you are socially distant, uh, more than six feet, a person can still get infected with the uh, COVID virus. This is especially so in enclosed spaces with inadequate ventilation or air handling, within which the concentration of the exhaled respiratory fluids, especially fine droplets and aerosol part uh, particles, they can build up in the airspace. And there's increase in inhalation of respiratory fluids if the infectious person is engaged in physical exertion, such as raising their voices, such as exercising, shouting and singing. And so when people in a the room, they are singing together, especially in church services or in a mosque or any place where people are singing, uh, these droplets can go further away. Also, prolonged exposure to these conditions, typically more than 15 minutes. So I, I, this is a very important slide. I hope you all be able to read it. And a very important principle. Huh? So can airborne transmission occur? Yes, it can. Indoor, indoors. Huh? indoors. So you see this person here, he, let's say he has COVID and he's coughing. The last drop that will drop within six feet. Huh? So this is what we mean by uh, droplet transmission. Okay, but then there are actually small, tiny particles that can actually float in the air within an enclosed environment and also infect a person that's standing even more than 10 meters away from the person with COVID-19. So this is what we thought earlier, you, uh, social distancing within six feet. Uh, uh, if you are socially distancing six, six feet, you won't be exposed, but not so in an enclosed environment. So then, uh, now if everything they say, you can get COVID. You take vaccine, you can get COVID. You use wear a mask, you can get COVID. You socially distance, you can get COVID. If <clears throat> you avoid crowds, also you get COVID. So people say, why bother? Why bother? Now, this is a very important principle. It's called the Swiss cheese respiratory virus pandemic defense. Here, we have to recognize that, that no single intervention is perfect at preventing spread. No single intervention is perfect at preventing spread. However, each intervention layer, imperfect as it may be, each layer, and when you have it all together, these multiple layers improve success. Improve success. So, there are two uh, categories, uh, personal responsibilities and shared responsibilities. Personal responsibility means physical distance, stay at home if you are sick, wear a mask, hand hygiene and cough etiquette, avoid touching your face, if in a crowded place, limit your time, and then from a societal level, fast and sensitive tests and tracing, ventilation, outdoors, air filtration, government messaging, financial support, quarantine and isolation, vaccines, border controls, lockdown. So these are all measures that are taken to reduce the risk of the person individually getting COVID and also as a community. So none of these layers is perfect in itself. But if you combine all these levels of defense, this then reduces the risk of a person getting COVID. So from an individual level, one is wear a mask. Okay. Very important to wear a mask when you are in an enclosed area, indoors, uh, at work. Avoid crowds. If you have to go to a crowded area, keep it at a minimum time. Socially distancing, yes. In itself, okay, if, if you are standing closer to the person that, the, who's infected, the higher the risk of getting COVID. Not only the higher the risk of getting COVID, the higher the risk of inoculum, the higher inoculum of a virus may get into you. And of course, very, very important vaccination. So while I showed you the Swiss cheese uh, principle where there are multiple layers, just to make it simple uh, for all of us, wear a mask properly, avoid crowds, socially distance, and if you can't socially distance, then uh, make it as short as possible, and please vaccinate and get boosted. 
protection induced uh, by currently uh, viral available vaccines against virus is primarily based on virus uh, neutralizing antibodies. Such antibodies usually block the interaction of the virus with the cellular receptor or prevent conformational changes required for the fusion of the virus in the cell membrane. So, this <coughs> what happens is the, vir the, the, the virus then actually binds into the ACE2 receptors. Okay, the ACE2 receptors. And this is how the body's uh, defense uh, uh, helps. So not, normally, okay, regardless of the vaccine, the B cells then produce antibodies that bind to the virus and then prevent the virus from attaching itself to the ACE receptors. This is one form of immunity, yeah? one form of immunity. The second form of immunity, that's, that's what we, uh, when we call we call it as a cellular mediated immunity. The cellular mediated immunity does not depend on antibodies. Right, I want you all to understand because many of the questions relate to this, this important principle. So, what the, the vaccine does is the vaccine produces antibodies, and these antibodies then bind to the virus and then prevents the virus from infecting the cell in the first place. But then our body uh, does not only kill the virus using antibodies alone, right. Our body does not, immune system does not kill the virus using antibodies alone. The virus needs the human cell to be a factory to create more viruses. And here is what is known as cellular mediated immunity. So you have the cytotoxic T cells in our body. Now these T cells, they attack these infected cells in our body and destroys them. They destroy the infected cell and hence stops the infected cell from producing the virus. It stops the infected cell from producing the virus. So there are two forms of immunity. Whenever we we'll talk about neutralizing antibodies, it's referring to the, the level of antibodies that is needed to prevent the virus from infecting the cell. And they often forget there's another uh, line of defense immunity that is called the cellular mediated immunity. So the T and B cell responses to COVID-19 vaccine. Questions are how long will the vaccine be effective? Uh, these are the questions you ask. And what type of immune response it produces and the longevity of that response. Now there are three possible immune responses generated by a successful vaccine. The production of B cells, number one, production of T cells, or both. So antibodies produced by B cells attack the virus directly. Antibodies produced by the B cell response to COVID is relatively short-lived. It is possible that individuals who have been infected or vaccinated against COVID-19 could develop a rapid antibody response to any subsequent exposure based on <coughs> B cell memory. So one important principle. Now, when a person is vaccinated or just gets uh, infected, the body produces antibodies, uh, and this is what it, at, at, at higher levels it's known as neutralizing antibodies. So what happens is, at time, as time goes by, inevitably, uh, not only for COVID nineteen, uh, any vaccine, the antibody levels in the body come down. They come down. As the weeks pass by, the antibody levels come down to below levels. But then, that is not the only thing uh, the vaccine does or an infection does. Uh, that's not the only thing the infection does. The infection also put, uh, causes uh, priming of the T cells and B cells, which retain memory of the COVID-19 virus that infected the person earlier or the, the, viral, uh, the, the, the viral antigens uh, that were produced earlier. So these are called memory cells. So it's just that when the, the neutralizing antibodies come down, 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 when a person gets infected, ah, there's not enough neutralizing antibodies. What to do? The body then, uh, the, 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 these new viruses then wake up these memory B cells and memory T cells. Ah, they say, oh, yeah, this virus is attacking. 
Now I will start to produce antibodies. So the antibodies then got very high, very fast again, very fast again. So the existing antibodies may be low, but the, this memory B cell then start producing the antibodies uh, fast to uh, go against the virus. So both memory T and B cell responses specific to SARS-CoV-2 have now found to be up to six months after infection. And similar T and B cell responses might be expected following vaccination. The mistake many people make, I mean the misunderstanding, I wouldn't call it mistake. The misunderstanding, many people are asking, what is your mutant antibody level? What is your antibody level, high or low, high or low? Yes, as time goes by, the antibody levels will come down. But there are also memory T cells and B cells. So the antibodies are not the whole story. Okay, antibodies are not the whole story. The T cells and memory T cells and memory B cells. Okay. Now, selective pressure. So this is another question. Why are there so many mutants? Why are there so many variants? Selective pressure occurs when the mutant viruses that can overcome the immune system or the vaccine survive and spread. So whenever we see variants, it is not surprising. By now, everyone in the world knows that Omicron will, will, won't be the last variant. There'll be more and more variants coming out. And it's inevitable because the viruses mutate. The viruses also want to survive. So various variants of COVID-19 are appearing around the world. And every time a variant comes, the concern is, is it more transmissible? Is it more virulent? And it may cause reinfection in people who are infected before. And it may cause the vaccine to be effective, less effective or not effective at all. So the more infections, the higher the risk of mutants. And this is so the more and more people infected, the more and more variants that can come about. And these variants may be more infectious and may be more dangerous. We don't know. Okay, we do not know. Hence, it's very important for us to control the number of people being infected. Now, it, it, it may seem like um, something that is impossible to do. How can you control people uh, from getting infected? It's seeing something that, that, that's beyond our control. Having, having said, I, to a certain extent, I have to agree with that statement. In, in a sense, if, if you see uh, the COVID-19, a lot of it seems to be beyond our control, but we do have some control in slowing it down okay, to a certain extent. Not to a certain extent, we do have, you know, so, so um, while we may not be able to prevent everyone from getting infected, we may be able to prevent most people from getting infected. So these are all the vaccines that are, uh, that are available uh, in Malaysia, the BioNTech, the Oxford, uh, AstraZeneca, the Sinovac. And here, look at this efficacy. These are all from the original strain, uh, the original strain the efficacy. So now these are all out of date, out of data. Uh, the Moderna, the Sinopharm, the Barat BioNTech vaccine, the Gamalaya, the Johnson & Johnson, and the Novavax. So the question is, do these vaccines work or not? Um, we've had data from other countries, but what about data in our country? Do they reduce the number of deaths? Now, we did a study uh, on the categorization of COVID-19 deaths by vaccination types and status simulation between February uh, and September 2021. Malaysia is very unique because we use three different types of vaccine. The inactivated whole variant SARS-CoV vaccine, that is the Coronavac, Sinovac vaccine, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, the, and the Austra, S, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, the, the, the first message I want to show you is look at this red line. The, the red line is those are fully vaccinated, these are partially vaccinated. And these are not vaccinated at all. Now, in all these three vaccines, all these three vaccines help reduce the number of deaths. Okay, reduce number. So, whether you took the Sinovac, the Bio, uh, Pfizer, and AstraZeneca, these three all reduce the number of deaths. So, they were effective in reducing the number of deaths and number of severe cases. And uh, we also did uh, age standard mort uh, mortality rates between these three. We found all three of them to be very effective. But when, when you compare Sinovac with Pfizer and uh, 
Oxford AstraZeneca. The Pfizer and Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine are slightly better than the Sinovac vaccine in terms of reducing the number of deaths. But I, I don't want people to miss the big picture. The big picture is all three vaccines help reduce the severity of disease and the number of deaths. Do not worry so much. And many people say which one is better, which vaccine is better. I, I, I would say, you know, and, and many people, I would rather people take the Sinovac vaccine than not take the vaccine at all. Okay, all three vaccines work in reducing the number of deaths. The efficacy of all the vaccines have waned with the Omicron variant. When we say efficacy, what it means is the risk of a person getting infected despite being vaccinated is higher now compared to the earlier days of the vaccine. It is inevitable. The, the, vi the virus will mutate and be able to escape the um, antibodies and the, uh, that are generated by the vaccine for all the vaccines, huh? not only for one. However, it's still shown that unvaccinated people are 17 times more likely to be hospitalized due to COVID-19. So here we define the Delta variant in the US uh, at, at the end of last year, slowly being taken over. Sorry, this is South Africa. The, the, these are all the Delta variant slowly taken over by the Omicron variant. Now, is it a good thing or not? We'll, we'll discuss it later. So you can see in, in France, Australia, United States, Netherlands, United Kingdom, they, you see, last time we thought the numbers were high, but when Omicron came, it, it all the numbers all shot up like a rocket. You know, shot up right like a rocket. It was very highly infectious in all the countries, including countries which previously did not have COVID-19, uh, that were thought to be success stories in controlling COVID-19. Countries like Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, they all have had very, very high cases, number of cases. This is the US. You can see the, the, the type of graph in the Omicron. Uh, it shoots up like a rocket. As compared to the Delta and the Alpha variant and the early variants, the spikes are more gradual, okay, more gradual. In Malaysia, we are no different. Huh? So at one time, we thought 3,000 cases were a lot, then 4,000, then we had Delta, we thought 20,000 cases a lot, but now with Omicron, it's uncountable. Huh? You know, Every day, we are putting about 20, 28 to 30,000, actually the cases are much more higher. In fact, every one of you probably knows someone who's got COVID in your family uh, or your friends. Definitely, even your family members have got COVID. And, and, and none of us are not infected. Even my son also got COVID. Right, none of us, every single one of us has been uh, affected by COVID or have a family member who has been infected with COVID. So the critical care admissions and vaccination status, despite the rising number of cases, this has not changed. This has not changed. The risk of uh, getting severe COVID is far more higher, my friends, for people who are not being vaccinated and lower for people who are double vaccinated and even lower for people who are boosted. And this is especially so in the people in the high risk group, those above 60 years and 70 years of age, and also 50 to 59, and also people with comorbidities. Remember the first slide I showed you about comorbidities, that's very important. So, so it is not the same for everyone. But if you have comorbidities, if you have diabetes, you have hypertension, you are elderly, you have a heart diseases, it's very, very important for you to get completely vaccinated and also boosted. Okay, because the critical care admissions, most of them are people, not, not people without comorbidities, not young people, but mainly people who are in the older age group. So here we have the uh, variants, uh, the Omicron, the Delta, Alpha, and, and I can assure you soon there'll be another variant coming out soon. So mainly the variants are mutations in the S gene. They're more transmissible and spreading globally and could possibly be more virulent. So now the question is whether Omicron is more virulent or not. Omicron, there are 30 mutations in the spike protein. It has a replication advantage. Uh, that means it can multiply more faster by far than Delta. And the next thing is immune evasion. There's a higher risk of reinfection and those who have been vaccinated. I think there's a question, why person still get 
infected despite being vaccinated? Well, it's because of the Omicron uh, variant, because of the mutations of the spike protein. So this enables the, uh, the Omicron variant of the virus to escape the antibodies that uh, were originally produced because the spike, the spike protein has already changed. The, the target of the antibodies is not there already, it's already changed. So this is the Omicron variant. So this, this researchers have determined that despite the myriad of uh, mutations, the Omicron spike protein binds tightly to the ACE2 receptor on the person's cell, okay? More than 30 of these mutations are in the spike protein of the coronavirus surface, which helps the virus to latch on to and infect host cells. Delta and alpha variants approximately 10 mutations in the spike protein. Now I notice a lot of questions uh, uh, will, will come out. And I hope uh, that even before you ask these questions, the questions that you have in this mind, the, the, the lecture that I'm, the explanation I'm giving you now will help answer the questions that you have and later on I can clarify it more uh, clearly yeah, for you all. It's postulated that Omicron requires a higher level of ACE2 to fuse to the host cells than do other variants. So lung cells generally have more, much lower ACE2 levels compared to the cells in the upper respiratory tract. So because of this, uh, Omicron variant, unlike the earlier variants, uh, they bind more strongly to the upper respiratory tract and less binding to the lower respiratory tract in the lungs. Okay, the Omicron variant binds more easily to the upper respiratory tract than the, the lower respiratory tract, which is in the lungs and in the alveoli. And this is a good thing. This is a good thing because if it binds more to the lung cells, that will make it more virulent and, and it affects uh, our respiratory system by far worse, like the Delta variant. And because of that, for the Omicron variant, there's more upper respiratory tract symptoms compared to the earlier variants. All right, so the Omicron variant, they get stuck in the upper airways more than the lower airways. You don't want the virus to go down into the lower airways, okay, lower airways. But it also means that there's more upper respiratory tract infections. So people sneeze more, people may cough more, they may have more runny nose. And, and because of that, that also contributes to the ease of this virus spreading to other people. Because if you sneeze, it's easier for people to get the virus. And, and ironically, to a certain extent, because many of people with Omicron, they, have, uh, they are less sick than people with Delta and the others, they are also more likely to be out there spreading the virus. So Omicron is very transmissible. Omicron is nearly as transmissible as measles. So uh, measles is usually taken as the gold standard on how uh, the most easiest <coughs> viral, disease, viral disease to be transmitted. So Omicron is nearly as transmissible as that. So it stays longer in the upper airways, expediting it to, to be from the nose and mouth and allowing the virus to find new hosts. Studies provide evidence that Omicron it replicates more readily in the upper airways than in the lungs. So Omicron is very transmissible. Omicron is also less virulent. Now, it, uh, whenever we talk about virulence, so many people ask, okay, is Omicron more or less virulent than something else? It's difficult now to do studies because a huge uh, percentage of the population has already been vaccinated, isn't it? So you, you cannot compare Omicron easily with Delta or the Alpha variant because the Alpha and Delta variant may have come about and caused a virulence in people who are not vaccinated. Whereas now, there many, most people have been either been vaccinated or even at least vaccinated or boosted. But then they did study now. We, uh, we put all the vaccination aside. Is Omicron less or more variant than other variants? So they did studies on animals, hamsters and mice. They were infected with Omicron and other variants. Now, of course, the hamsters and mice but did not get any vaccine. Huh? So they did study in animals. Major differences were found. The concentration of the virus in the lungs of animals infected with Omicron was at least 10 times lower than rodents infected with other variants. So the concentration of virus in the lungs huh, in Omicron is much, much lower 
than the other variants, which is a good thing. So other things have also noted that compared with previous variants, Omicron is found at reduced levels in the lung tissue. So many people, you, you may ask, hey, doctor, is Omicron, uh, you know, is, is it a good thing or bad thing? Well, in a, to a certain extent, it's, a, it's, it's not a good thing because it's much more infectious. Uh, more people can get it. It's almost as infectious as measles. But is it a good thing or bad thing? On the other hand, you can say it's, it, it, it's not uh, necessarily a bad thing because it is taking over from Delta, which is a much more virulent variant, yeah, which is a much more virulent variant. So you see, the virus also has to survive. And it cannot survive if it kills its host. Okay, it cannot survive if it kills its host. So it, while we say uh, we have to try and lift the virus, the virus is also trying to live with us. And the virus can't live with us, humans, if it kills us, you see? So the virus also mutates so that it can live with humans. Uh, I just want to make this as uh, generic and as uh, so that you know, we can understand. It is in the virus interest to be less virulent, to not to kill the host, or rather make the host very ill, because then the virus also dies off. So by uh, nature of uh, survival of the fittest, the fittest virus is not the virus that kills. The fittest virus is the virus that can adapt to humans and live with humans without making humans sick and dying. So uh, it is less virulent, but however that's in that, as the virus mutates, there will always be variants that will be more infectious and more virulent. Uh, it is a chance. Huh? It's a chance. There will be. But at least Omicron is less virulent. And this is shown in studies. Huh? Risk of severe disease with Omicron variant infection is less than other variants they've shown in studies. Uh, severe disease uh, in, in, uh, in hospitalizations. As you can see, although there are 30,000 people in Malaysia getting uh, COVID-19, you don't find our hospitals filled with very, very sick people as we did uh, last year, somewhere in July and August. Early animal studies suggest that Omicron specific boosters offer no advantage over the uh, dose of current vaccine. So the current vaccines, you know, uh, someone asked a question, is there any Omicron variant uh, vaccine booster? At least the ones now, there's no advantage over the third dose of the current vaccines. Now, boosters have a positive effect on the memory B cells by inducing them to ramp up the antibodies to fight the virus. I remember I told you earlier the principle of the memory B cells. Both the original vaccine and the updated jab prompted a rise in the animal level of cross reactive memory cells, those that target many variants, not, not just one in the vaccine. So the memory B cells, the antibodies, the cellular-mediated immunity, yeah? the cellular-mediated immunity and the antibodies from the memory B cells, they, we want a vaccine that can generate immunity that's not only good against one variant, but against many variants now and in the future. So this is the Delta variant. First dose efficacy is 94%. Second dose efficacy is 96%. Eh? But as you can see in the the effectiveness of the Omicron, the prevention of an infection, has come down from 93 to 70 percent. 93 to 70 percent, and not only that, as time goes by, the antibody levels come down, the efficacy of the vaccine goes down, which means to say the risk of getting infection becomes higher and higher as time goes by, as the uh, antibodies in the body become lower and lower. But that's not the whole story. Remember, that's not the whole story. What the vaccine does is definitely does it, it reduces the risk of severe disease and death. Okay, the vaccine reduces the, uh, the risk of severe disease and death. How many boosters do we need? Omicron changed our views on the boosters as a means of reducing the risk of infection and risk of spreading the virus. Antibody response from two vaccines is insufficient to prevent the infections. The response of the booster also wanes with time. So back to square one in terms of preventing infection. Uh, so there's a question why go booster for infected but still going, but still got infected. So what it tells us is that vaccination, even with the booster, 
while it reduces the risk of getting infection, it is not 100%. As, and as time goes by, as the antibody levels come down, we are back to square one in terms of preventing infections. Bottom line, despite being boosted, you can still get infected, especially with the Omicron variant. But that is not the end of the story. Yeah? Um, I'll, I'll come back to that. Hence, it's not a viable long-term strategy to prevent infections. Priority should be given to people from nations who are unable to be even completely vaccinated. So now in Malaysia, we're talking about booster, booster. But in many countries in Africa and many, many other countries, they are not even able to vaccinate a person with even two vaccines. So what are the vaccines for now? If they cannot re reduce the risk of getting infection, we can still get infected by, by getting the vaccine. So what's it for? My son, don't take right. No. Uh, many people give that argument. Why, you know, people, I took the vaccine, still can uh. No. This is very, very important. Uh. Whenever someone comes with COVID, the first question I ask is, has, has this person been vaccinated or not or boosted? That is the first question you ask in any given, any hospital you go anywhere in the world. That is the first question we ask. If they say it's been vaccinated and boosted, the prognosis is good. Not vaccinated, prognosis is bad. You know, prognosis is bad. If a person gets admitted to the hospital for severe COVID and not vaccinated, my friends, prognosis is bad. Prognosis is bad. Vaccination will reduce the risk of severe disease and deaths. The protection against severe disease is more durable. The memory B cells and T cells remain capable of battling Omicron even as the antibody defenses decline. Real-world data from the United States, the United Kingdom, and Israel show that the third booster shot of mRNA vaccine protects most people against hospitalization for up to five months against Delta and for three months or more against Omicron. This more durable immunity also wanes, but to a lesser extent. So COVID has gradually become less lethal over the pandemic. So this is the good thing about the Omicron. Eh? In the beginning time, the, the, the uh, risk of dying is 20 times that of flu. But as, it, as time goes by here, the risk of dying is only two times more than flu. Okay, Two times more than flu. So it has gradually become less lethal over the pandemic, mainly because of immunity. Okay, immunity. It is more dangerous than getting the influenza, but, but it's much less dangerous than it was originally was. So this is something to give us hope. Okay, to give us hope that this virus seems become, becoming less and less virulent. So when we talk about risk, uh, what is the risk of dying? This micro mod, one in a million chance of dying. So if you take a flight, uh, one flight, you have a 0 0.02 in a million chance of dying in the flight. If you drive at 250 miles, you have a one in a million chance of dying. Motorcycle, four in a million chance of dying. If you drive for 25. Scuba diving, five in five. Five in a million for one trip, that chance of dying. So many people say, what's the risk? What's the risk? So we have to have something to compare it with. Now, this is the risk of COVID, risk of dying. Okay, so here, we, 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 we put go to the unvaccinated. If a person is not vaccinated and is 65 years and above, the risk of dying is 28,978 over a million. Okay. On the other, on the other hand, if uh, they are um, 65 and above, if they are boost, boosted, the risk of dying is 6,023 in a million. This is roughly an estimate. But if you compare between the boosted and the unboosted, 28,000 divided by 6 is what? Four, five times higher, right? Five times higher. Uh, not boosted is also high, okay? So this, this risk is very important, okay? This risk is very important. Now, the strategy is, number one, is to protect individuals against severe illness. It's no longer with Omicron realistic to say that we can protect people from getting infected because they can get infected, but we can protect individuals against severe illness. Now, boosting to shield vulnerable groups. So those who are vulnerable, they have to be boosted. In fact, 
The reason why Hong Kong is having a lot of deaths is many of the elderly are not vaccinated or boosted. And antivirals will keep people out of hospital. These are the current antivirals, Remdesivir, Paxlovid, Montpuravir, Sotrovimab, monoclonal antibodies, and, you know, uh, Baptilovimab. I think the government is uh, uh, trying to bring in Montpuravir and Paxlovid into, uh, into the country. In fact, this one yesterday, I think yesterday it was approved by the NPRA to come into our country. So the question is, is there any antivirals now in Malaysia? Can you go to pharmacy or any private hospital have any antivirals? At the moment, no, not in Malaysia. Don't ask me why, but not in Malaysia yet. Okay. So the vaccines that we ultimately need is a vaccine that's longer enduring effect, protects against multiple and existing strains, and we also need a pan-coronavirus vaccine that will cover all strains. So this is the vaccine that we're looking for. Hopefully, they'll be able, they'll be able to, to uh, research and manufacture a vaccine that can do these three things. Again, uh, in hospitalizations and children increased four times in August in places where low vaccinations in the United States compared to the levels with high vaccination. Now, side effects of vaccine, now, taking a COVID vaccine, I can't deny, it's not, not pleasant. It's not like getting your influenza inject, uh, vaccine or your mom's measles rubella vaccine. In the, in the, there, is, there are unpleasant side effects. Okay, I have to admit that the side effects are not pleasant. You can have pain at the side of injection, tiredness, headache, nausea, vomiting, fever. But most of these side effects are not dangerous. Huh? A severe anaphylaxis is five in a million deaths. Well, there have been deaths due to myocarditis, uh, uh, myocarditis and uh, uh, clots in the brain. Investigations are still higher. The COVID-19 mRNA vaccine and myocarditis, yes, COVID-19 has uh, vaccines. The mRNA vaccines have a higher risk of causing uh, myocarditis. But actually, what are the rates? What are the rates in males? Um, in males, it, it's about uh, about 120 for 12 to 17, 128 in a million, uh, in a million, uh, roughly about um, roughly about 50 to 60 in a million. So in females, it's less. It, it is very very rare because if they get COVID, if they get COVID, the risk of other side other adverse effects other than myocarditis is higher. So myocarditis is 16 times higher among patients with COVID-19 compared to patients who have, do not have COVID-19. So while the vaccine gives a person a risk of getting myocarditis, getting COVID-19, the risk of myocarditis is far more higher. Then you also have something known as vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, where you have thrombosis of blood clots in the brain, in the stomach, uh, in the cerebral veins, the spanning veins. And these are because of antibodies directed against failure factor 4. Okay, it's extremely rare. So the risk of cerebral thrombosis is about 2.4 per million in the general population. But then uh, for those who are vaccinated, the risk of uh, cerebral thrombosis is 3.6 versus 0.9 and 0.9 per million. So it's higher than the general population. But if you compare, if a person gets COVID, the risk of cerebral thrombosis is 10 times, oh no, almost 200 times higher. There's 207 per million per million patients in the hospital. So what I'm trying to say is, get the vaccine, yes, agree, the AZ vaccine can cause cerebral thrombosis, yes, but if you're not vaccinated and get COVID, the risk of a person getting cerebral thrombosis is 207 per million. So the risk of that, death and serious outcome of COVID-19, including small thrombosis, thrombosis far away the small risk of EIGT. Antibody-dependent enhancement, that's the thing that, you know, you get vaccinated, then the higher the you, the risk of getting severe COVID is higher. It's not true. Right? It's not shown. Uh, in fact, it's the opposite. People are vaccinated, get milder COVID compared to those who are not vaccinated. Herd immunity is an indirect protection. The population is immune either to vaccination or immunity. So will we achieve uh, herd immunity with uh, Omicron and the vaccination? It's very, very difficult to say because COVID-19 has proven to be very elusive. It has actually, uh, you know, everything that we say, uh, everything that we say turns out to be wrong later on. You know, so it's very hard to project when herd immunity will be achieved. 
So what does herd immunity mean? Herd immunity essentially means that uh, the risk of person who's not vaccinated and not uh, infected before, those who are not immune, the risk of them getting the virus is less, far less, because the people surrounding them do not have the virus. Okay, so you look at this this person, he's uh, infected, he can only infect one person because all the other persons are already immune to the virus and they cannot get infected. So when that happens, that's when herd immunity occurs. So the more people who are immunized against the virus who are <coughs> have some uh, immunity against the virus, the less people who are not vaccinated can get the virus. The proportion of population that must be vaccinated against COVID-19 to begin inducing herd immunity is not known. Estimated range about 70 to 90%. Example, measles require about 95% of the population to be vaccinated. Polio, the threshold is about 80%. So how do we prevent ourselves from getting uh, infected? So now, yeah, this is the worst case scenario. Both are unvaccinated, both also not wearing masks. So the risk of transmitting is very high. Okay, very high. The least risk is both are vaccinated and both are wearing masks. So the risk of them transmitting to this person and this person transmitting to this person is very much reduced. So this is what we are aiming for. Vaccination and masking. Okay, vaccination and masking. And hopefully there'll come a day where we won't have to wear masks. So these are the choices uh, of the risks that you face. One is be infected with COVID-19. I don't want a vaccine, I want to take my chances. So I get infected with COVID-19 and hope for the best. That's one. Number two, be vaccinated with COVID-19 vaccine. You may still get vaccinated, infected, ah, no denied. You may get infected, but you have a lower risk of severe COVID and death. And the third one is, I don't want to be vaccinated. I don't want to be infected. What can you do? You can isolate yourself and don't mix with anyone. And there's no humans, but that's not possible. So we are left with only these three choices and you have to choose which one you want, all right? I advise number two, be vaccinated. So my, my friends, uh, we are all in this together. It's a tough time that we've gone through for the past two years. And we will all get through this, uh, get through this disease together. I'd like to thank you very much for your kind attention. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Timothy Williams, for that very, I must say, very comprehensive talk with a very sobering last slide. Only three choices in the world. You can either go to the North Pole and stay there with the polar bears, get vaccinated, or take your chances on COVID. So I think it's a lot for us to chew over because it's such a comprehensive and uh, a presentation that I'm sure you've got questions. So what, before we go into the question time, we just let you have some time to think over it while we watch an alpha video. Then I'll come back and bring some of these questions to Dr. Timothy Williams. And meanwhile, can you all just uh, send your questions to the comment section of Facebook and YouTube? Okay, we'll see you at the other end of this video. Life moves fast, doesn't it? Every day, there's so much to fit in. But do you ever stop and think, what's the point of it all? Do you ever ask yourself, is there more to life than this? Alpha is a series of sessions exploring life, faith, and meaning. It's a space where you can ask all the big questions, say what you think, and hear about other people's points of view. First, there's video and then discussion. Each video explores a different aspect of the Christian faith, and then in a small group, you get to say exactly what you think. The aim of each video is to spark conversation, each week unpacking a different question. It's an opportunity for you to hear from others and contribute your own perspective in honest, open, and friendly environment. So why not try it out? My 
friend introduced me to Alpha. I learned about Alpha from my wife, a restaurant owner, which we, which my parents and I have a dinner there, and she's actually kind enough to share the details of the Alpha with us. When you have question, you can go to Alpha because there a lot of people will come. When you put forth your question, they will clarify your answer. See the same thing in different manner and from different perspective you can see. I benefited from the Alpha course uh, through growing spiritually and sharing my ideas with other people and basically meeting so many other people. I'm able to stand up from floor falling to depression as I've lost my son not too long ago. What I learned when I joined Alpha is to ask questions which can be difficult um, even for people like me who's grown up in church but in a safe environment where you can discuss things that you're not sure about or work through your doubts. Nice game, nice people, so I met, I had a lot of fun also. So that's the Alpha program. So some of you who are out there um, and want to know more than COVID and want to look at the purpose of life and the meaning of life, please contact First Baptist Church uh, regarding this excellent program that will actually walk you through uh, what we feel is the meaning of life. All right. So now let's get back to the question and answer with Dr. Timothy Williams with us. We've got a whole bunch of questions we're going to highlight uh, in a minute. But we'll start off with... Um, Look, Tim, uh, you think the worst is over? Um, yes, I think the worst is over. Ah, the worst isn't is that over. good? Um, <laughs> I, I think um, from a, a society level, uh, you know, uh, when, when I say worst, I think uh, you, 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 you must know what the worst is, right? So the worst is, I think, what happened in the Klang Valley, right, last year, around june to august yeah uh, we had hospitals that were overflowing people not having enough oxygen where the whole healthcare system was totally overwhelmed in Asia. right so i i think the worst is uh, i think the worst is over in that sense like you know okay so in the in your in in, in your specialty you would know the history of pandemics and virulence is it the natural history of organisms that uh, with time they become less virulent the variants uh, yes yes they do they do ah, so um, that you see uh, uh, dr peter um, when it, it's a bit difficult to to know the virulence of the virus now because people are vaccinated already isn't it so people who get infected are the ones who have already been vaccinated whereas you remember the, the, the original uh, Wuhan virus in early 2000 uh, to 2020? That time people were not vaccinated, right? They were not vaccinated, but they didn't get sick either. Many of them didn't get sick until Delta came about. So it's difficult to compare uh, the virulence of variants because people have already been vaccinated. Vaccination has already come into the picture and they've been already immunized. So when you get another virus coming in, you don't know whether people are getting less sick because they've been immunized before or because the variant is less virulent. Can we take any lessons from the H1N1 history that has become less virulent over time? Uh, actually, H1N1, uh, later on we discovered it wasn't that virulent to start with it, uh, the beta. You know, H1N1 was never that virulent. And... Um, the, the COVID, uh, if, you, if you think about it, uh, it started with a mildly uh, 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 variant that wasn't very relevant, you know, Dr. Peter? Mm. When you first came out, you had many people asymptomatic, mildly symptomatic, and then later on, Delta came out, 
and it was more virulent than the original variant. So uh, to say that uh, a virus in the future will be less virulent uh, may not be very accurate. Okay. They are variant. But, but having said that, uh, a more virulent virus will be less likely to be as transmissible compared to a less virulent virus. Oh, so there's two components. Uh, there's two components. Uh. One is the virulence and the other one is the transmissibility of the virus. Oh, so they have a reciprocal a rela- arrangement? Uh, uh, yeah. so, so I give an example like uh, Ebola virus infection, right? Yep. And the reason why Ebola doesn't spread is because it kills the host very fast. It makes the host very uh, sick very fast. The reason why HIV spreads whole wide is because it is not very virulent to start with, you know, when a person gets HIV. So uh, when we think about the COVID-19 virus, uh, it is it, it is a two-pronged uh, thing, you know, one is the virulence, one is the transmissibility. So you may get a more virulent virus, but less transmissible. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, you know, I want to address the issue of herd immunity. And it seems I'm a bit confused. When we talk about herd immunity, we want 70, 80, 90% of the population to have had either vaccination or COVID. But is this herd immunity variant specific? Because we're talking about yes. 70, 80% variant specific because a new variant come then you don't have herd immunity yes yes we're always yes. losing isn't it yes so very hard it's very hard to predict you know um but uh but one thing is uh, the the people who get uh, um infected again infected again usually get a milder milder disease okay that means someone who's got vaccinated before and infected before when they get covid again it's usually milder oh okay Right. Why is that? Because they already have a certain level of immunity against the new variant. So you, you may not have a total immunity against it, but your immune system can kill components of the virus, other components of the virus. So if Omicron now is estimated to be twice as dangerous as the flu, is it about time for us to treat it like the flu, throw away our masks and... Forget about the quarantines and all this. I think um, you see the it. Uh, this is a public health question, uh, which I'm not an expert in. Uh, that I, I admit, like, you know. But I, I think we we have no choice, like, You know, we have no choice uh, in the sense that this virus is going to be with us forever. You see. So the question we have to ask is: Are we? Go- how long are we going to wear masks? How long are we going to have our movement control and border controls? Knowing that this virus is going to last for years and years. You see? So it's now about a a human tolerance for mortality. What is our human tolerance for mortality? Yes. Uh, So so as time goes by, you can can see the graph, uh, the the, uh, the, the virus, virus virulence appears to be just almost two times as influenza as compared to earlier. And I mean, this is my own personal opinion. I think we all have to live with the virus. You know, we'll have to live with the virus and we'll have to take precautions uh, that we feel ourselves are willing to take, the risk that we are willing to take. So I, I at this moment now, I don't agree so much with mandates already or whatever form already. Uh, mandates meaning to say you force it on the individual to follow. You see, now. Whereas it was important earlier in the disease, but not so now. So I would hope to see a case where people behave responsibly themselves rather than the law imposing it on them. So if you want to wear a mask, reduce your risk of getting infected, then go ahead. But if you don't want to wear a mask, uh, then you don't wear, you know, with it, it's within your rights, lah. Okay, good, good, good. Why don't we have the Slido up uh, with <coughs> questions from the from the community? Okay, all right. There were some recent YouTube videos highlighting some DNA change in liver cells of those who vaccinated with mRNA vaccines like Pfizer. Is this true? Is it fake news? Should we be worried? 
Uh, no, we shouldn't be worried. We shouldn't be worried because uh, uh, I've read the paper. Uh, to put it in a nutshell, uh, they, in that paper, they don't mention anything at all about integration of the, the uh, viral uh, vaccine particles into the cell DNA. There's none. There is none. Uh. Oh. So uh, I don't, we shouldn't be worried at all. Uh, you know, this this uh, paper is a good paper, I have to admit, but it's been it, it's been mis it's been misrepresented uh, by people who don't agree with the vaccine to fit with their narrative. Oh, right. Okay. So I, I, I it's I, I can't give uh, this person. I'm sorry, I can't give a one sentence answer. Uh, sure. Towards it, that uh, because it's more complex, but the the point is the point is there's no integration of the vaccine induced uh, RNA turning to DNA into the cellular genome. The paper ah. does not mention it. You know, it doesn't prove anything. Okay, See? good, good. Ah. All right, next question. Explain why a positive PCR test will allow us quarantine-free travel and for how long? You mean a negative PCR test or a positive? A positive. Test? After you've got the PCR test, apparently you can have quarantine-free travel? Like supposedly Djokovic? Um, I'm not sure about that. Like, you know, uh, it's certainly not our country's policy. We are positive uh, for PCR unless you've already been infected before. Yes. Yeah, I'm so talking yeah. about infected people. Or oh, infected people, yes. I mean, if a person is infected and after seven days, they're no longer infectious, uh, the PCR that is detected from them, you see, PCR doesn't tell you whether the uh, is coming from a live uh, virus that can multiply or a dead viral particle. So after a person has got infected, the dead viral particles are still there and they, they, these can still be detected by PCR. So PCR just tells you there are viral particles. It doesn't tell you whether the virus is alive or not. And after day seven, the person is non-infectious. So despite being PCR positive, they don't need to be quarantined and they can travel. Okay, good, good. Uh, how many months after the infection are we going to be PCR positive? Actually, uh, it ranges up to Peter. Some people after seven, eight days, they're already negative. Oh. On the other hand, there are some people who are ill, they can remain PCR positive for two, three months. Oh. Oh, so okay. uh, it, it's, it's difficult to say. Right? All right. So let's have some questions from Kenny Sim. She's put up, he's put up two. If all mem family members in the household are positive, can they move freely or need to be isolated even though some have recovered? You mean within the household they can remain? Within the household, yeah. Yes, they can move freely. They can move freely. Okay. If a vaccinated person recovers from COVID, do they still need to be boosted? Can we rely on our natural immunity? Okay. Now, um, uh, this is not an easy question to answer. Like, you know, I have to, I have to admit. Uh, so a person who is vaccinated, they get COVID, do they need to be boosted again or not? Um, my opinion is if the person is in a high risk group, it means if you're above 60, you have diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, even the renal disease, this and that, then I think you, you, you should get boosted. All right. On the other hand, if this is a person who is young, who's young, who doesn't have any comorbidities, this and that, it's okay not to get boosted. Okay, so there's a, the, the answer is a bit more nuanced. It depends on the situation. Okay, all right. The, the silent killer aspect of the COVID, can it be mitigated by a pulse oximeter? And, and, and the, which, which means if it is, do, can, does everybody have to have a pulse oximeter? So anyone who has COVID uh, and is being treated at home, self-monitoring, the pulse oximeter is a very essential part of cell monitoring. Okay? Oh. Yeah. So what it means is you monitor yourself, your oxygen levels are more than 96%, then you are, you are okay. But if your oxygen levels drop below 95%, then you need to seek treatment. 
okay, I have a friend who's had COVID and he's going to the, he's, as he's working out in his home gym. Does exercise exacerbate the COVID or should we rest? What should the person oh, do? At I, I think they should rest. It's very important they should rest because COVID doesn't only infect the lungs, but it can also affect the heart and other organs. So if they are exercising COVID and they have myocarditis as a result of COVID, they can get heart complications as well and all of all other complications. So please, if you have COVID, then rest at home. Don't exercise. Okay, good. Don't, don't be a hero. I mean, don't, don't, don't. I mean, one says you you can take a walk, and I suppose, but I, what I'm talking about is heavy exercise. You know? Yeah. Okay. Good. I think that was a very good advice. Does it mean that we should have our COVID nineteen uh, immunization? Um, but does it mean that we would have our COVID-19 immunization already having caught COVID-19 after having vaccine booster shots? Well, it's a very funny question. <laughs> no, I think the, the, the question the always comes, I already got, I already got immunized. I got my two doses and then I got COVID. Do I still need to have a booster or not? Yes, yes. Uh, you see, that, that, that's the question we always get. And how soon should I get a booster? Um, yeah. Right. Uh, I, I don't feel it as strongly as a person who's not been vaccinated. So a person not been vaccinated, very clear. Please get your vaccine immediately. All right. A person who's been vaccinated uh, and need a booster, yes, please go ahead and get your booster. So now we have this group, fully vaccinated, not booster yet, but got COVID in between. Should you get boosted or not? This part, I'm not, I do not have very strong opinions. I don't have a strong opinion. So if you don't want to get boosted, I think it's okay. 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 I think it's okay. Right. All right. So uh, another question, are there new booster vaccines coming out which can adapt to the COVID variants, especially the Omicron specific ones? Yeah. There was one that didn't work well, but the problem is we are, it's a bit of chasing the wind, you know. By the time you come up with the Omicron variant vaccine, there's another new variant coming out. You see? So that's why they, they have to try and develop vaccines that are a, a pan-coronavirus vaccine. You know, they can, okay. they can so, work, you know. Before that happens, now all of us are vaccinated and boosted. What's going to happen? Uh, are we going to have another booster in a year from now? What do you think, Tim? I think, uh, Peter, I think our booster will come by a COVID infection, a natural booster, <laughs> before a new virus comes out. You know, you oh see? dear, then we might die also. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, if you look at it, um, uh, it, it, it seems inevitable, not necessarily infection, inevitable that all of us will be exposed to the COVID, uh, COVID virus or coronavirus. In fact, uh, the four most common vi uh, cold viruses are coronaviruses, so we will be exposed. We may be asymptomatic after we get infected, or very mildly symptomatic, or we may not even know that we get infected. You see, and uh, and getting a vaccine out uh, is not easy. Also, you see, proving its safety and efficacy is also not easy. What's the deal with the fourth booster? Those Z data to show that the fourth one is any good? Actually, they, it didn't. You know, it, they did it in Israel, and they didn't find it to be very effective. The port oh. Now, having said that, uh, uh, there are people who, despite being vaccinated, cannot mount an immune response, adequate immune response. For instance, people are immune suppressed. Okay, people are immune suppressed either because of uh, drugs that they are on or their disease. So, for these people, uh, vaccinations, even if they get vaccination, the vaccination may not be effective. Uh, so, for these people, that is why for these people, herd immunity is very important. Herd immunity uh, is very important to protect people who cannot be vaccinated for some reason or oh. who are vaccinated and who cannot mount an immune response. So these are why this is why herd immunity is very important. Okay. But uh, not everyone will respond to the vaccine, you know, not everyone will generate antibodies. Okay. Uh, you did mention the more uh, people get uh, infections, then the more variants going to come. But another issue is. Will the use of antivirals, monoclonal antibodies, induce more variants, just like antibiotics in inducing, you know, uh, resistance among bacteria? Yes, yes, uh, um, definitely. When we get uh, the antivirals out, 
in public, uh, it's inevitable that the, the the virus, just like the vaccine, it does vaccine, will mutate so that they can overcome the antivirals. Oh. See, the question is whether it will cause more virulent variants. I think that's more relevant. Then will the uh, the virus become more virulent, more dangerous? Uh, will using this antivirus in in the in a, you know uh, uh, unwan unwanted uh, uh, yeah yeah okay side effect, so, uh, that one we don't know lah Peter you know, we, we would have the judicious know. use by doctors rather than to give everybody to buy it over the counter yes, I suppose. exactly exactly yeah okay exactly uh, the next question uh, I think we've already answered we'll go to the one after that uh, does anybody know if vaccine decreases the risk of long COVID before versus after? Yes, definitely. Definitely. It reduces the risk of long COVID. Definitely. Okay. So that's good news. Uh, latest question for the, down there. Uh, Favi Piravir, an antiviral was used to treat COVID patients uh, in hospital and it works, but of late last year, it was removed from the treatment protocol. Why? Because it didn't work. <laughs> it oh, it didn't doesn't work. work. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> Very expensive, you know. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't work. Six thousand dollars worth. Okay. Yeah. Uh the new France variant, IHU, uh, how bad is it compared to Omicron? You, know, you know, you know, this kind of thing is very hard to say, right? Any new variant, not only the France variant, to see whether it's bad or worse. I, I don't think we should um uh be too overly concerned with the new variants, variants that are coming out. There'll be many, many variants. And I hope CNN and all the news will, will, will stop making it breaking news when there's a new variant coming out and causing everyone to be so worried. Okay, there will be new variants. But uh, just isn't how it w, WHO is the one that's uh, causing the trouble. They always come up variant of concern. I what know, does that mean? I know. But there'll be more and more variants, Peter, coming out, you see. And um, the, the the fear is uh, the public will get will, will get too uh, immunized, uh, so to speak, against this that they will forget the basic things, you know. Uh, okay. The, 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 you see, uh, the, the, there's a, a COVID fatigue, you know. Now, <laughs> yes. And when when you keep keep crying wolf, keep keep crying wolf, people stop this thing. You see, you know. Yeah. And then when they, you have a really bad variant coming out uh, in the future, when you start warning people, then no one's going to listen to you. You see? Yes, okay. Yeah. Right. Based on the data from MOH, the dominant variant in Malaysia, Delta, not Omicron. Is that true, uh, Dr. Timothy? No, no. no. I, I think that, the no, first of all, yeah, people must understand it's not easy to get a diagnosis on what variant is in, out in the community. You need to do whole genome sequencing. And you're not doing enough of it. Uh, nor do I think it's really necessary, la, you know, uh, to know whether it's Delta or Omicron. I don't think it's really important. What's important is for you to make sure that people are vaccinated. So if you're not vaccinated and you get Omicron, it's equally bad. You see? Okay. It's bad. So. Right. Now, uh, this uh, other question is, I think, Timothy, you've already answered that, already, so we'll avoid that. So uh, even in both parties with masks, can you actually have transmission by Margaret? Yes, yes, you can, obviously, because uh, everyone is masked, but everyone who got COVID, you ask them, they all wear masks. So uh, you can still trans transmit COVID. It's just that you reduce your risk of getting uh, okay. COVID. Okay. Uh, if a person has COVID, can they take other vaccine like influenza vaccine? Yes, yes, you can take uh, influenza vaccine, your mumps, measles, rubella vaccines. There's no uh, limitations to it. No time period you can take it. Okay. A Hong Kong study showed unvaccinated male hamsters suffering uh, from testicular injury, uh, erectile dysfunction. Oh, I wonder how a hamster get erectile dysfunction. Uh, lower sperm count. Is this issue seen in male cave no, COVID no, patients so far? No, actually we've seen... Uh, um, yeah, yeah, that, that, exactly. I mean, we, uh, Dr. Peter, you are the expert in this. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't heard of, I haven't heard COVID affecting the erectile dysfunction. <laughs> That's a new I one. I think asking the wrong person, Dr. Peter, I need to ask you the question. 
I, I better <laughs> look up on that. So I I, I plead ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think we'll skip that till we get further research. All right. Uh, <laughs> Ivermectin works to prevent people from catching COVID and it has no adverse effects like COVID vaccines. Why don't we use Ivermectin? Same issue, the last few seminars. Uh, so better ask, answer Christine's question. Um, we, 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 we don't use Ivermectin because it doesn't work. Right? You know, if, if Ivermectin works, I'll be the first to use it. Right? It, it just doesn't work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think there was a Ministry of Health study, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Not only the Ministry of numerous studies have shown it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi. Is our good bacteria a good immune response to fight COVID, which means the bacteria in our gut? I suppose that's what they mean. Uh, no. I mean, good bacteria is good immune to fight any 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 disease. Uh, not specifically for COVID, uh, but I, I I don't know the answer to this question and we don't know the answer. Yeah, okay, all right. Okay, so uh, if there are no more questions, I think we've had a great uh, session, very comprehensive uh, talk by Dr. Timothy Williams. I thank you very much on behalf of the church and on behalf of the entire community. This is what we really need, you know what? To put the truth out there so that the public is armed with knowledge and knowledge will actually save lives rather than succumbing to fake news. Thank you for spending time with us this afternoon. Um, we'll look forward, hopefully not to catch forward, catch up with you again in the future. Hopefully this pandemic will be over so we don't have to have another talk about a new variant coming to plague us. Uh, yeah. So you have a good day. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank and I'm you. going to hand the session over to the next chairperson, uh, Mr. Peter Davidson, who's going to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Christine Mariana Gabriel, to talk about riding the wave of COVID-19 anxieties. Thank you very much. Peter, Thanks, over Dr. Peter. to you. Thanks, Dr. Peter. Good to have you over. All right. Um, we're blessed to have, uh, again, Christine uh, with us to be here. Christine has uh, both a uh, bachelor's and a master's in uh, marriage and family therapy, uh, practiced both in the United States as well as here in Malaysia, and now is pursuing a PhD along with lecturing in um, one of the leading private colleges here in Malaysia. Um, so, uh, Christine, let's jump straight into it. You know, we've had a fantastic uh, talk here by Dr. Timothy. Um, could you just tell us what, what you've been seeing in the field for the past 2019 Two and a half years on how COVID has uh, been affect has been affecting uh, people on a on a personal level on a on a psychological and on a psychological level. Right, um, right. Thanks, Peter. So, um, can you hear me clearly? Just checking. All right. Okay. So, um, well, I guess you know a lot of it we have been seeing in the news of how the uh, increase in people's stress level, uh, suicide rate is increasing, um, how to deal with death, how to deal with family members being diagnosed with COVID. Um, family stresses are really high, so issues between husband and wife, uh, childcare duties. So these are some of the things that um, you, I mean, it's very prominent for at least for the past two years. Uh, mental health issues have always been there, but it feels like COVID brought it to awareness even more now. Um, okay, so let's just let's just go to delve into maybe one of one of each the, each of the few things that have happened. So let's talk about the anxiety of um, at least getting COVID. Um, has there been any um, any particular cases you've been facing of having to counsel people and how they've been able to cope with it? On um, you see, it, the example they don't want to go out to uh, again uh, because they don't see their friends because I might get COVID. I don't want to go to the shop because I might get COVID. I quit my job because my boss makes me go into the office once a week and I might get COVID. What have you been seeing on this level, Christine? Right. So I would say, Peter, this a lot of it depends on um, a person's level of how they uh, take in information and what they do with the information as well. So like even today, when we hear Dr. Timothy talk about all this, a um, lot of information about transferability and things like that, so a lot of it is new for me as well, right? So this information can either increase anxiety in some of us here, or it can help us to feel more in control 
of certain things, right? So some of the cases like I've personally seen with whether among my circle and also professionally is how uh, people use this information, right? So there have been individuals um, who whose anxiety is much higher after being exposed to all this information. And there are individuals or families who seem to cope better. And um, maybe, you know, they are being careful, but to a very, to an appropriate level, I would say, because anxiety can be divided into what's a normal reaction to any situation versus uh, anxiety to the extent in which it, it disrupts your functioning, right? Like you're unable to, to do your daily work. So then that's a problem. Right. So um, I, I know um, when it, everyone's an individual, everyone's unique, um, uh, but let's, let's try to at least to be able to help to categorize people or help people, people categorize themselves, hopefully not to, to categorize their spouse and use as a weapon. Um, how would, <laughs> <laughs> I use it too often. All right. Because um, um, you're know, saying there are people that people and how they choose to um, take in information and how they and how they digest it. Some do it as we can do put it in a shorthand positively. Some some do it in a mm -hmm. shorthand negative manner. How do we let's talk about ourselves? How do we know if we are doing it positively or negatively? Is there any part, particular way we can find out so oh shoot, I'm actually the kind of person that will do that will take it in negatively or oh actually I'm not so bad. I'm not I, I can I can actually do it some way. Are there any self help exercises or self-test that we can actually do to I say, mm, I'm, I'm, I'm one or the other? Right, right. That's a, that's a very good question, Peter. So I would say that um, there are some individuals who are more at risk for psychological vulnerability. So what that means is that uh, they may be more prone to overthink or things like perfectionism or a sense of uh, dependence, overly being dependent on certain uh, things and individuals. So Individuals who tend to be more, uh, I would say, vulnerable psychologically, uh, perhaps they will struggle more, right? So as compared to individuals who have maybe greater support system or uh, have conversations with friends um, or even having a faith community at large, having family systems who are able to, um, to sort of cross-check and see, you know? And of course, you know, things like uh, research, at least, you know, sorry to bring in something <laughs> heavy, but research shows, at least with COVID-19, um, younger women and those who are uh, sort of, uh, uh, I would say, a lower education, you know, exposed to lower educational um, information, all these people are more vulnerable to, I guess, to overthink things, right? Really? My mother said older as well but never mind um a younger women actually for low education um i i know it'll be all on a steady decline as age goes by but then uh, when they say younger women is there do they do they put up in particular brackets when they say how what is a younger woman younger woman yeah younger. so there's one research that was done last year i believe it's between 26 to 35 but this was done in uh, north africa middle east so in malaysia um there's no much research being done on the impact of covid on mental health yet uh, but one of one of the possible reasons for why uh, younger women may be affected is because there is sort of a greater um, stress on childcare duties, right? Because oh, uh, yes. yeah, because you know you're confined in your homes, and then how you, you the, the stress level of taking care of your kid, um, all these affects one's mental health. Yes, I was about to say that's the that that exact correlation between that particular age and childbearing age. This is about the time your child be right. zero to three. Right. Zero to five years old. Um, so technically, as a younger woman, or is it is it more accurate to say as a younger woman or as a as a again a uh, as an as a young mother? It has has there been a cut in that area, or is it or has it all just been lumped into young, younger women for that? Mm, I would say yeah. I would say mostly young young mothers. Uh, but mm. these are I guess this particular research was also focusing on young women um who have lower support systems. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. And we'll we'll go, we'll go into the support system shortly on this one. Let's look at the other side of this thing. So you see, people that are prone to overthink are people not overthink to be more anxious. As you mentioned, people are younger women and people with lower education. How about people on the other side who think that they're that they're invincible and nothing's going to touch them? 
what what, uh, what kind of people are this like on the other side of the spectrum? Uh, uh, you mean people who seem like they're not going to get COVID? They're not going to get COVID. COVID right. will die. COVID will die when it touches them, kind of level. Right. You know? <laughs> right, right. So I do see a lot of people who seem to have this perceived sense of that I'm strong, and oh, um, I'm yeah, yeah. Like I'm, I'm healthy. I'm strong. I'm exercising daily. I'm taking my vitamins. But I guess as Dr. Timothy, you know, highlighted earlier, like um, if you're not vaccinated, your chances, no matter what your your um, level of strength is uh, physically, but um, your prognosis will be bad, right? So yeah. there are a lot of individuals who seem to perceive that. And um, and I think people get tired of SOPs as well. You know, in two years, like you're tired, mm-hmm. like we're done with COVID. We want to go out, you know, like, um, but still, you know, we, the SOPs, I guess, like what Dr. Timothy mentioned also, we have to live with this virus. You know, it's yeah. about what's the new normal for, for a lot of us. Yeah. Um, just to make it easy for the viewers to understand what kind of people, because we, we made it simple to find out who is more, more, more people who be more anxious. Can you make it easy for you people to identify whether they think that they, to identify if they are the kind of person that will think that they'll be, they'll be infected? Is it young men between 26 to 35 as well? Or is it something else? <laughs> yeah, well, I guess that's a bit more complex, Peter, because... The risk of someone getting COVID is different from uh, the risk of someone being more vulnerable to mm. the mental health um, conse- uh, consequences of the pandemic on them. Yeah, so mm. I wouldn't say there are specific types, but again, I will sort of lump it all to those who are most psychologically vulnerable. Okay. Yeah, so they would have more struggles in uh, managing the anxieties around COVID. Okay. All right, let's jump on to the support systems which, we were talk, which you were talking about earlier. You mentioned friends, family, and uh, you call it religious groups. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are other ways to define it. Um, could you tell us what, um, could you help define to everyone what's a, what is a support system and how could you not tap onto it, but how could you uh, say a support system is working? For you? You, you are working the support system, not everybody's working for you. So, for example, um, I can see, yeah, I've got a, I've got a family there, um, but they're all based in a, um, in, in a, another state. Can I say I've got a support system when I don't talk to them every, every day? Mm-hmm. When do you call a support system actually you, when you actually work a support system or not? Can you tell us about that? Yes, sure. Thanks, uh, Peter. So, support but I call system. me David just now. I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, support system is when you have, I guess, one is when I have an ability to reach out and to respond to others while also receiving others' response to me. So it doesn't have to be just family and friends, but it's my ability to reach out, to say, hey, I I need something. I need help. I need um, support. So one's ability to, to be able to do that and trusting that they will be responded to most of the time. So you need to be able to have that trust, right? Because sometimes when we when we maybe text in the WhatsApp group and say, I have, I think I'm having COVID, and how you're being responded to and the way you're being responded to may not feel supportive, right? Or you may start to feel judged or and things like that. Right. So having it's sort of like having a, a felt sense of security to know that you can, and even if it's not your family, even if it's not your friends, there are communities that you can reach out to and trust that 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 is going to help you to get through that difficult phase or that difficult time. Um, I'm just thinking, no, I, w- I wouldn't slot in the advertisement right now. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, so um, I, I'm going to go off tangent for this one because um, I'm, not, I'm not experiencing it, but I know someone that's experiencing it quite well, um, a bit more than, than, than they should or than they should. Um, sometimes... Um, how would you how would you be able to do to discern okay whether your whether your web of friends or your con your your your, your circle of friends you know whether your circle of friends are being um, again um, how is it put this way are being toxic okay or are being um, again constructively critical because um, um, I know I am. I, um, you know, you know, people say, oh, when I, whenever we talk to my friends, they're so, again, they don't, they don't support me. They just, 
say I'm wrong all the time, but maybe you could be wrong all the time kind of thing. Is there any way to help discern these things and help to bring yourself through an exercise of whether finding out this support system or your perceived support system is a correct support system for yourself? Right. I would say, I think uh, for a start is for me to just ask myself, what kind of support am I needing? as well like do I need more physical sort of support do I need more mental health support um, and also to discern whether is it more on a professional level support or is it family and friends support so when it comes to friends I, I'm going with what you're asking specifically Peter um, if your friend's response that comes back uh, is triggering some sort of emotional reaction in you right that you feel like um, not heard not understood judged um, and, and a lot, anything along the lines of unpleasant emotions you can if you're comfortable you can actually share and let them know that no this is not helping me right or this is not helpful um, if there's trust in that relationship you can reach out and say that uh, or even prior to that you know if you have a very open sense of conversation with them you can say hey you know this is what I'm needing right I know you're trying to help I know your intentions are uh, that to be there for me but what I really need is for you to listen what I really need is for you to help me connect me to other resources that uh, would would match what I'm needing right now so I guess that conversation is important okay so I, I um I got um last question on support on support system because I'm interested in this one so technically um it is still up to the individual which is always individual responsibility to be able to call out their own support system as well. And they can't just, to an extent, sit down and mope and say, oh, my friends don't do this kind of thing. They actually had to call the support system and say, hey, I would like to be, um, again, supported or counseled in a certain way kind of thing. And they have to give that kind of feedback. Do you, do you, um, I'm, I'm, I'm overgeneralizing when I say this, but from, the, from what, you've, what you've seen so far, um, do you find that Asians are a bit more... Uh, me being an Asian, again, are a bit more um, reserved in telling in telling others how they really feel and what they really want. Um, yes, certainly, certainly, right. Okay. Um, I think there's this overall feeling of not uh, sharing with a stranger, not airing your dirty laundry. Uh, so those kinds of things does impact. To what extent do we reach out and ask for help, or um, the sort of like this, you know, like don't tell anyone about this you know this is this is a private issue this is a family issue right so yes to answer your question yes all right, cool. mm -hmm. all right. so step number one in, 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 in um helping ourselves to overcome anxiety throughout um step number one helping us to again uh not helping uh, helping us to again ride the omicron wave in, 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 in points of anxiety is get a support system Okay, um, let's talk about step step number two, or at least the next one we can come up with. Um, what what else has been um, what what have you been what have you been uh, seeing in the field on the side? Once the person has support system, great. What else can they do, um, or what else kind of what other kind of tr common troubles would they normally face as they go through uh, as they ride through COVID nowadays? Right, I think uh, I think on an individual level as well to normalize to learn how to normalize that you're not alone in this. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you're not the only one experiencing because sometimes when we are triggered we would think that why what's wrong with me is it just me that's feeling this um, am i the only one that's experiencing this so to normalize to know that uh you're not the only one and that's why i mean i it will i'll always go back to support system as well <laughs> that when you do reach out you will know that you're not the only one that is experiencing this you won't feel alienated and that itself will help to sort of mitigate some of the stresses that you're experiencing um thought on this one okay um i know i know almost no case out there is unique at the same time every case is unique um, mm -hmm. but, um but what um what, what kind of what kind of situations would people normally think that they're the only one going through it um uh because they say, you know, oh, I'm the only one that's going through this kind of thing. Therefore, no one I know in this area is doing. What do I, would you advise them to? What would you advise this person to do if they think they're the only one that's going through this? Right. Um, usually, a person would experience that if they have not received sort of feedback about what they're thinking and feeling about from another person or individual. So I would personally say like, 
um, giving feedback. In fact, we us giving feedback to others. Like it seems like you are um, really thinking a lot about this, or it seems like this is really affecting you. Like sort of receiving this kind of feedback will help to recognize like, okay, wait, you know, sort of, I would say self-introspection, you know, self-interrogation, you looking within to see, am I um, exaggerating this phenomena in my head and to feel like I'm the only one that's going through this? Right. So because, that's, yeah. Uh, so, uh, sorry, just, just to, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't understand that part, so I apologize. So are you saying you we are then, interrog we should interrogate ourselves to think whether we're the only person or we should then ask people for feedback. What were you saying? I think I, it's both. It's both, okay. right? So you you ask for feedback and, and okay. take it with an open mind, right? Because okay. sometimes we are our worst critic as well, right? So you don't want to yeah. be too hard on yourself. But when you ask for feedback, and feedback is also very important to get from people who um who has the intention to help you grow. So I would say Correct. professional professional feedback would be best at best okay. to get as compared to individuals or, or family systems who um, who are labeling you and who are judging you, which can make the problem even worse uh, for what you're going through, right? So I would say it's both, right? Getting feedback and, and you pausing and thinking about um, how's this affecting me and being curious with your own body system, right? Like what's happening in your own body, paying attention to all these things. Okay. Um Let's talk about the point about give, get, get, uh, receiving feedback. I know I have this issue, okay? Um, because when I receive feedback, I think they're wrong because they're not as smart as me. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, um, and of course, uh, they, uh, um, my, 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 standard, my standard reaction in my head is, I mean, you know, they're wrong, okay? You know, they don't know the full picture. Mm -hmm. And um, again, um, they, don't, they, they, they can't see things the way that I see things because obviously... I see things better. Um, so, um, what would be, uh, and of course, the other other people say, and, and of course, top of this would be things like, you know, I don't. Um, um, again, I will feel, um, I feel bad when I really hear what's wrong with me because sometimes, most of the time, I don't want to know what's wrong with me. Um, mm. So, what will you tell? What, what will you tell? The, um, what will you tell everyone out there on getting feedback? How should you a prepare yourself? And how are there any particular? ways of receiving feedback and um in my head it would be like you know at, le at least i'm I, I, for me i will always say okay stop enough feedback for now i can hand um that's it but some people may not have that kind of button just to tell they're going to stop so how should we prepare, uh, prepare for feedback receive feedback and work on feedback you know is there a particular method of going around this thing right um i think one it starts with you trusting that the feedback is not meant to destroy you but it's meant to help you, right? So, and who you receive feedback from also matters, right? So for me, how I gauge uh, whether that feedback is helpful or not, sometimes is based on how I my body is responding to, to the feedback I'm receiving. Because sometimes the feedback might be helpful, but I may not be ready to, to hear that feedback. So if I'm not, okay. and what that means is that uh, perhaps I, I hear it as a criticism. I hear it as a, a, a belief system in me of like, you're not good enough. You're not doing this right. So a lot of this has a history of trauma that may be, that may be connected to it as well, like unresolved issues within me. So in that sense, it's about when I do receive feedback, who's giving me that feedback and how am I hearing that feedback? Uh, paying attention to my my body as I receive those feedback. Because like I mentioned, um, we may not be ready to hear that feedback. And if we are not ready, that's okay as well, right? It's okay. And maybe what I need right now, it's more assurance rather than feedback, right? So these are, these are the things that we can pay attention to. So even when it comes to um, COVID and how we are managing our anxieties around COVID, it's good and it's helpful to receive feedback from others on how they are experiencing how we are managing anxieties um, around COVID. And sometimes uh, when people give you feedback, like, wow, you know, I really uh, look up to the way that you're handling this. It seems like you have lost family members. It seems like, you know, you have many family members who have been diagnosed with COVID, but I see that you are taking care of yourself in the midst of uncertainties so th that is also a feedback so positive feedback is also a feedback because it kind of gives you that that green light like okay keep doing this you're on the right track right all right last question on this one before we go into the question of the public um i want to know what's been 
I won't, call, I won't call it the volume, but from what you've experienced or what you've seen so far, what is the biggest in terms, it's not the volume of cases, but the deepest impact um, or the deeper impact you see in, in terms of, in terms of, uh, oh yeah, the, the, the impact you didn't see coming, but actually it's bigger, meaning that this one, okay? Um, yeah, we all, we all think that, okay, if you lose a spouse or you lose a child, that's the biggest impact it's going to get. Fine, we can we kind of see that one coming. But have you seen that, you know, people that lost their job and said there's a big impact or people that have, are just, um, not big impact, but it was, it was a surprisingly bigger impact than we thought on the, on the individual or things like loneliness wasn't a surprisingly big impact or someone's dating life just, has just shut down. What was the surprising case they didn't see, case they didn't see coming, but oh, wow, this is something that's really happening right now in the past two years due to COVID. COVID. Um. I think there's two things that's coming to my mind as you ask this question. One is, I would say, relationship. Okay. So the biggest impact that uh, COVID, uh, the pandemic is having is uh, the, the relationship with, that we have with ourselves and the relationship that we have with people around us. So, and, and how that looks like. So this is the second part. How it looks like is um, marriages, you know, that's being impacted a lot. Uh, students in universities, you know, relationship mm-hmm. with their education, uh, relationship with um, uh, between parent and child, uh, relationship between employer and employees, between colleagues. So I would, I would say that the greatest impact here is relationship, right? How, what's my relationship with myself and parts of myself that I never knew existed uh, sort of being made aware and relationship with all the systems and people that I'm part of. Yes. Um, I, 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 um, um, the, the part of relationship in marriages, that was, I don't say it's hyped up, but that was quite well um, shared on, on most media. So we're quite familiar with this one, but I just noticed this, me having, not having a child. So I kind of noticed this one. How about relationship of students with their peers? How has that adjusted? Because they're not going to class anymore. They're seeing everyone mm-hmm. through a screen. Have, have you seen any interesting, not necessarily bad, but interesting developments or situations that turn up from people, from, sorry, from students not going into class? Or, yeah, what, what have you seen in this area? Right. So, um, so I do lecture as well part-time. So what I noticed, at least from my personal experiences and also from other students who have shared experiences is that there are some students who um, go in into like a, a program and not being able to be in a classroom setting at all in universities. So it sort yeah. of takes away that experience of going to college, uh, discussing face-to-face sitting and, and uh, talking about assignments. So all this does have, a, I guess, a toll on a lot of students in terms of their mental health. Okay. Um, most students seem to be more depressed uh, or in self-diagnosing. So I noticed this a lot. So a lot of students, uh, they Google the symptoms that they're having and then diagnose that they're having depression or anxiety. Oh. Right. I thought they were going to say, you know, the standard answer was uh, you have cancer and uh, on that home doctor, on that home doctor thing. Okay, fine. What? Depression. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I've never tried this one, but yeah. Um, again, my, my, my wife tends to my, my, my wife tends to self-diagnose as well on Google. So I was like, oh, okay, sure. But yeah, nice. self-diagnosis, self-diagnosis is, is, is on the rise on that side. Yes. Um, yes. Besides depression, okay. Now I'm I'm curious in this one. Besides depression, what other psychological um, ailments would someone else come up with besides depression on Google? Oh, that's a lot. So, um, <laughs> Just anxiety. give you two, the, the second one, the, second one, the most common one after depression. What's the next most common uh, anxiety. one? Anxiety. Anxiety. Yeah. Okay. You have anxiety, you have depression. Okay. Two most common ones. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right, Christine, let's go straight to what's happening on the floor while people are asking. I'll ask, can the team put up the Slido questions? All right, cool. From Anonymous, number one. Okay. How, to, how, do you ma- um, how do you manage loneliness, anxiety, and stress during quarantine when diagnosed as being COVID-19 positive? Besides getting a support group, what else? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so. I think this, uh, for the lack of better way to say it, it could be an invitation for you to um, start really looking at what um, 
are your area of interest in terms of your gifts, in terms of your talents, uh, watching videos that makes you smile, right? So, so small, small things like this actually has a great impact. So things that makes you laugh, things that makes you smile, uh, watching movies, sort of distraction to know that, uh, well, of course, support system is still number one, Peter, I would say that. Um, having someone to call and check on you as well would be very helpful to know that you're not alone. Hey, how are you? Did you eat? Did you not eat? Um, what are you needing? Do you want us to deliver food? So these are some of the ways that you can, like sort of reflecting for yourself, listening to music, mindfulness. So these are the generic things that you can Google and you can also get these answers as well. Interesting. Um, uh, again, okay, if you're COVID-19 positive and you're, uh, again, asymptomatic, could be quite easier. But when you're symptomatic and you can't mm. handle, handle most physical things, then yeah, it gets harder. It, I understand it, it'll get harder to, uh, again, if you want, if you say, I like to exercise and work out. So, oh, shoot. Yeah. <laughs> so you probably need to rest a lot. Sleep and rest. Sleep and rest. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, second, second question. What COVID-19 cases have you seen handled in the past two, two years since the outbreak? Um, are there any particular, so this one, I'll, I'll elaborate on this one. Are there any particular interesting cases that you have seen that are a bit more unique in nature um, um, than, the, than the more regular things people normally hear on the news? Not, yeah, on the news. Mm, no, I wouldn't say there's um, anything interesting, Peter. It's mostly cases that uh, people have lost family members. Uh, people have been diagnosed with, with uh, friends or family who have had COVID. Um, I wouldn't say there's anything interesting. It's somewhat related to the things that we have been talking about earlier as well, right? Like how do you manage the anxiety that impacts the relationship, whether it's between husband and wife, parent and child, um, students, a loss of job. So mostly around these things. So um, since um, I didn't I didn't touch more, I didn't want to talk about the marriage back then. Let's talk about marriage or yeah marriage marriage and uh, marital relationships right now and how they've been impacted. Um, and for those who don't know as well, okay, um, what 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 has the, how has COVID nineteen, aka working from home and a bit of the COVID anxiety of getting COVID, how has it affected the the couple then uh, the, the dynamics of the of the, of the relationship? As well as what are the common ways to uh, to help to um, to uh, help to mitigate the issues? Um, the biggest thing I've seen is uh, at least with couples who have kids is the childcare duties. Okay. So how when while they're working from home, how do you um, delegate? Like who's responsible for doing what? Yeah. So I would say that what would help most is communication openly communicating, uh, making time to communicate, expressing. So these are some of the important things that is really needed. All right. Okay. Communicate with your, with your wife and wives do what you're doing all the time. Okay. <laughs> all right. Talks a lot. All right. <laughs> how, to hand, how to handle a close one who is COVID-19 positive? How to help them? The natural instinct is to run away and make them feel bad. Correct. They got it right. Social distancing. Um, um, how, okay. So basically, asking how how should we um, how do we handle it with someone when when we have a contact who is COVID nineteen positive? First of all, how should we react? Um, um, I just say start with ourselves in this one, and how should we then help them? What's the what's the best way to go about it? Right. Um, I think the first thing is, of course, you know, um, social distancing for yourself. You need to always make sure that you're not going to be infected, but. Next is to sort of assure. Assurance is very important that it's going to be okay. Um, we can get through this. It's an illness. There are ways to get through this. We're going to get help. Um, and then two is how to help them. Is It's important to check in, to call, to ask, how are you? So a lot of times we feel like we don't want to bother or we don't want to disturb or we want them to rest. But I would say that just calling and asking, how are you, makes a big difference. Okay. Um, yeah, just to ask, how are you? Even if they, they feel like, you know, stop call. If they are telling you, stop calling me, then you maybe stop call. Then you stop calling. But I think calling every day and asking because your symptoms can, can shift very quickly up and down. So knowing that someone's asking, how are you? Did you eat? Um, uh, what are you doing? You know, and, and sort of distracting their mind from their symptoms as well. 
will be very helpful. So calling them, asking about the symptoms, describe them from the symptoms. Right. Well, we call to ask them how they are generally, <laughs> right. because some people, because some people would want you to ask about symptoms and some wouldn't, okay. right? So it depends right. on who you're who you're interacting with. I got you that one. Sorry, I take cues. Um, <laughs> all right. Next point. Um, my my boss does not understand my COVID nineteen fear, especially when I have a slight fever. How do I manage that? Um, I guess in, in regards to this, it's about for us to also know whether our fear is it, uh, because fear is, is it, it can really uh, exaggerate anxiety, right? Okay. So sometimes when I do have a slight fear, it is very common to feel like, okay, is this COVID? Do I check? Uh, but if it's getting to the point of it being, um, I would say, I wouldn't say dysfunctional, but um, like you're saying that like, I can't come into work or I, I can't work, I'm not doing, I'm not being able to finish this task on time, then if it's a slight, I guess I, I'm, I'm not clear about what slight fever is as well, right? If you can still work, then maybe this is you just feeling really anxious, taking a lot of deep breaths, um, calming yourself down and getting to it is okay. But if it is getting to a point where you are not able to work and you're not able to focus, then it's very important to communicate to your boss that I'm unable to focus. I'm having fever. When, oh, from, okay, so um, get Christine, for me being from HR, um, if this is a concern, like, you know, if so on, 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 this goes on to a, on a standard medical leave uh, um, issue, but I'm going to ask you as, 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 a, as a mental professional, a psychological psych, uh, yeah, mental professional, is there such thing as a medical leave from, um, again, uh, when you are not physically ill, but mentally anxious? Is that, is, does that exist on that side? I'm, I'm curious. Uh, no, not, not that I know of. At not the moment, Malaysia. Unless, yeah, yeah. Unless, okay. unless you have companies who, are, um, who advocate for mental health. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So, um, so let, let's just, let's try, I'm, I'm, because this is this, the, this, uh, HR ish thing is let's dive into a bit more to have a few caveats over here. Okay. So one, um, when I have a slight fever, how do I manage that? So is your boss saying two things? Your boss is saying again, come into the office even though you have a slight fever. That's a possibility. Um, I would have to say, uh, can't you get a medical certificate that you can't they can't come to the office? If you can't, then do you have a slight fever or not? Mm. But, the, but the next question is oh, oh my gosh oh I'm going so I'm, I'm, no, my, I'm so let's still go back to let's still go back to where we were but the question is um, I th I've I've seen this thing on this side um, in terms of again how companies and how companies act on this side um, how um, the company does not understand that you know at COVID nineteen forget the slight fever but companies um, um how do I put it this way. Company says, come into the office because you have to come into the office and they say, and they don't take into consideration the risks of COVID-19. How do I deal and cope with that? So maybe that's a way of talking to your boss. Do you have any particular ways of speaking to, to superiors on, a, on how to express how you feel and, and communicate with them? I think there's a bit more, a bit more how we should advise and decide how we communicate with our superiors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good point. How will you do so, Christine? How, will you, how, how should we, you know, nicely do it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think there's no, like, clear-cut cookie answer for this, Peter, because a lot of it depends on um, how open your boss is as well to have these conversations. And also uh, their level of, uh, or the skills that they have around mental uh, awareness on mental health issues. So I would say the best is always having an open, honest, respectful conversation and telling um, I'm afraid, I'm scared, I have fever. Um, and then from there, I, I guess it's also a responsibility of your boss to make sure that, you know, you're, you, you are um, at the best state in order to work as well, you know, given the current pandemic, especially. For those who are looking for a support group to get further advice on this from others, we can join our alpha course and we can uh, possibly connect you to someone for a deeper conversation for on. Okay, um, next. Is there a national de depository on statistics on, and different types of mental illnesses faced by Malaysians during the pandemic? Interesting. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. So not yet. No. There's no any numbers yet on the uh, statistics and different types of il illness faced during the pandemic. I think even prior to the pandemic, it's still being updated. Um, so we are, I, I, I think Malaysia still has quite a long way to go in regards to uh, recording the statistics on mental health illness, um, how, and, and I think some of it also depends on how open people are to, to acknowledge because the stigma is really high. Mm. Yeah. Um, two so things no, to, answer, to answer the question, no, not for the pandemic, we do not have the numbers yet. So, okay, three things now. So Christine, is there, um, are there other countries that have recorded it quite well that you know, know of? Uh, yeah, I think there are other countries that are uh, who are more open. I think the West, in the US and the UK, there are research that's being done, uh, questionnaires that's being shared out. Yes. And how about, okay, so so, so those watching, try check on things um, again on from, from the States and the UK. People are quite, I prayfully, quite the same across the world. Um, it could be different. Uh, second of all, how about private records? I'm not saying private, like, like you know, um, by by private companies that do these kind of records. Do, do they exist in the, Do they exist in Malaysia that you know of? Um, not that I know of yet, not or at least it's not being shared yet. Okay. Yeah, it's not okay. available. Yeah. Okay. Fair, enough. Fair enough. All right. Next, doctors have mentioned that we have to live with the virus. How do we, how to deal with people around me who just cannot move on? Let's think about that question. Dr. have mentioned that we have to live with the virus. How do I deal with people who just cannot move on? Um, we're going to discount that we're talking about people, not people that have lost someone and can't move on for that one. We're going to discount that kind of uh, thought. We're going to dis let's try this um, talk about people that say, how do we deal with people that are just constantly, for lack of a better word, living in fear? Um, yeah, so it's, I, I'm, I'm not going to say it's PTSD. I'm going to say it's um, people that are constantly scared of something that may not really affect them in the end. It's like you've been vaccinated 20 times and then you say, oh, you know, I still might get COVID. Same way we might still get measles kind of thing. Um, how do we work with people that are still, you know, back, like a better word, living in the past? I'm talking about this five years on the future. So, Christine, how are we this, how are we this one? Um, assurance. Lots and lots of assurance, I would say, uh, because when someone is still still living in fear and cannot move on, um, there is no trust that things will be okay. So hearing lots of assurance and of course encouraging them to receive professional support and help is also important. But I would say assurance is, is one of the biggest things that can help someone a repetition of that assurance, gently, kindly, empathetically, compassionately. Christine, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask, I, I know it's tough. And I know, again, once, we, once you give the answer, people are going to self-diagnose and, and take the message into their own hands. But when should we, when and how do we draw, um, draw the line, but make it, yeah, draw the line between, you know, being, being um, again, nice big teddy bear, and tough love with our friends or our contacts. When do we say, you know, um, again, instead of always, oh, it's okay to snap out of it kind of thing. When, how do we draw the line on that mm. one? I think that's a very good question, Peter. So when someone is already um, struggling with anxiety mm. and uh, sort of unrealistic fear sometimes as well, tough love, it's going to make the problem worst. Okay. Right. So it's not, it's, it's you're going to just, sort of uh, exaggerated within. So it's it's always good, or at least the approach that I take, maybe other counsellors might have different approaches. The approaches I take is to sort of, uh, sort of invite them to be open to a different way of thinking, invite them to be open to a different way of being, um, gently sort of, I would say inviting, asking them if they're open to talk to someone about this, that they're not alone. Yeah, so... If there is already a sense of anxiety and fear, tough love, I would say it's a no-no. Okay. Mm -hmm. if, if you're looking for someone to talk to, please join our alpha, alpha course, and then you can find people to talk to, talk to there. 
All right, they asked the last question. <laughs> um, what is the psychology of those vaccinated taking, oh, this one, I don't know, AEFI news offensively and perhaps fearfully? How do you help them overcome such anxieties? I have to ask Christine, what is AEFI? Uh, yeah, it's also new to me, but um, I believe it means that um, uh, support team was AEFI. Yeah, adverse, <laughs> adverse event following immunization. I think so after you get your vaccines um, news, you know, how do you, I, I think I would say that it's the same thing in regards to how you manage your general anxiety when it comes to COVID mm -hmm. that um, how one perceive information, it really depends on how vulnerable you are to that information as well, like how generally. Right. So I would say whatever information that you read, whatever information that you're exposed to, uh, even when it comes to vaccination, not those who are not vaccinated. I know many people who who are refusing to be vaccinated. Right. So what is your set of beliefs and attitudes towards a certain information and how do you communicate that? Who do you communicate that with? What does your support system look like? All these are factors that can help one person to overcome their uh, anxiety. Okay, um, I'm going to try to take a, take a dip into the past of this one. Um, was there anything such as this where we, where we have EFI or something similar? Yeah, yeah, I got it here. Okay. Um, EFI or something similar in the past 20, 30, 40, 50 years that we had this kind of thing. Um, did anything of a similar pattern have? Um, was there, something, was there something of a similar pattern in the past? Um, I'm not so sure about that, Peter. Okay, yeah. no worries about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, 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 all, most of it just backs down to our, our fundamentals of, uh, again, uh, of this one. A, having a support system, and uh, B, being ready to take in feedback, as well as not give you taking in feedback and working around that feedback, and most importantly, um, getting over, um, not getting over, Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, being taking feedback and um, of always uh, being ready to be open to be vulnerable as well as what's that word called again? Huh? Yeah, sharing, yeah, sharing, 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 sharing what's inside. Correct. Um, but yeah, um, Christine, um, any particular um final words you want to um, um sign off with 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 everyone else over here? Um, I would just want to say that uh, we can all do hard things together. So whoever that's struggling with the pandemic, I mean, I myself have gone through my own fair shares of anxiety with COVID. So to know that you're not alone and uh, reach out for support. Fantastic. Christine, it's been glad. It's been great having you over. Okay, looking, looking to have you over again next time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Take Christine. All right. Life moves fast, doesn't it? Every day, there's so much to fit in. But do you ever stop and think, what's the point of it all? Do you ever ask yourself, is there more to life than this? Alpha is a series of sessions exploring life, faith, and meaning. It's a space where you can ask all the big questions, say what you think, and hear about other people's points of view. First, there's video and then discussion. Each video explores a different aspect of the Christian faith, and then in a small group, you get to say exactly what you think. The aim of each video is to spark conversation, each week unpacking a different question. It's an opportunity for you to hear from others and contribute your own perspective in an honest, open, and friendly environment. So why not try it out? My friend introduced me to Alpha. I learned about Alpha from my wife. A restaurant owner, which, we, which my parents and I have a dinner there and she's actually kind enough to share the details of the Alpha with us. 
when you have question you can go to alpha because there lot of people will come when you put forth your question they will clarify your answer see the same thing in different manner and from different perspective you can see i benefited from the alpha course uh through growing spiritually and sharing my ideas with other people and basically meeting so many other people i'm able to stand up from floor falling to depression as i've lost my son not too long ago what i learned when i joined alpha is to ask questions which can be difficult um, even for people like me who's grown up in church but in a safe environment where you can discuss things that you're not sure about or work through your doubts nice game nice people so i met i had a lot of fun also